It's been a privilege, or it will be a privilege, to uh, welcome our guest speaker today. You can see from there that his name is George. Uh, it's pronounced differently in Austria, apparently. I'm not going to try. And, of course, he's going to talk to us something about, well, I don't know what he's going to talk about, but <laughs> he's an Austrian trade commissioner. So, goodness knows what that means. But um, I'm sure it'll be very interesting. And, George, the floor is all yours. Mr. President, Ron, past President Ron, uh, dear Rotarians and dear uh, gentlemen, no ladies here today, so gentlemen, it's a big privilege for me to be here for two reasons. First of all, it's a privilege to be here because you're interested in Austria and I was very moved to hear this and once I came in here I saw that you nearly all of you are German speakers, I would say, and, uh, Germany, and you have a twin a Rotary Club there, and I know some have been to Austria, so I don't know if I can tell you anything new. Uh, the question mark is good, it's there, we'll see what comes out of it. The second thing is that I'm privileged to be here because I was a Rotarian myself when I was posted in Finland and in India, and uh, it was always nice to be a Rotarian, and it's nice to see that Rotary doesn't change, and it's the same procedures, the same way you live Rotary, and that's very nice. That's why I'm very privileged to see it. be here again. Now, I put together some slides to talk about Austria, how I see it from my point of view. This doesn't mean that you have to see it that way. And uh, I would just like you to interrupt me and to ask questions in between, and just to see if you want to know something else. So this is one point of seeing it, and of course, it is more on the trade side, because I'm dealing with trade, and uh, I'm sure you know more, more about Austrian music than I do, but I wanted to show you a little bit of that part, another side of Austria. By the way, do you know this picture? Do you know something about this picture? Do you see something which you might know? This is uh, countryside in Falberg. <laughs> well, not, not really, it's up to you to decide. This is from Anthony um, Gomley. His figures which were put up in the mountains in Falberg. And so this was a wonderful event of English art and Austrian mountains coming together. And I went there for skiing and in the summer for walking. And you walk and then suddenly you see these figures everywhere. It's wonderful. <laughs> Unfortunately, they're back in England. Or oh, luckily. Anyway, so my question is with the question mark. If you have some pictures here, is, is this Austria? I suppose you know the gentleman in the middle and the people on the left, which you know better than we do, because we Austrians don't know much about the family of trap and sound of music. This is what we, learned from we have no idea. And just a few years ago, I got that CD to see what everybody's talking about. Now I know. So this is, I think, what the picture very often is about Austria. So my question is, or oh, is this Austria? And this is another side of Austria, which perhaps is not so well known. But this is how we also tend to see it. And I want to show you a few facts and figures. And just it's not all the numbers which are important here. It's just to see the size, the relative numbers. <coughs> if you look at UK and Austria in comparison, you see, of course, population is, is nearly eight times as big here in the United Kingdom. So you see that uh, it's much bigger. Also, area-wise, it's quite a little bit bigger. If you see us as a part of the EU, the UK is much more important, of course. And uh, we are approximately the same situation in wealth and richness. So there's not much difference there. We have the same problems with inflation and the same problems with not having economic growth. So I think we're all in the same spot where there are some differences. If you see the unemployment rate, where Austria is quite uh, one of the lowest in Europe, because we have a system where with vocational training where we try to get the youth off the streets and into business. As, but what we also see, and I think this is also quite a difference between the United Kingdom, England and Austria, is that we have a self-employed rate is very low. It's half that of the United Kingdom. So we have much less entrepreneurs and people who have their own companies than you have here in the United Kingdom. I think this is a big difference between our countries. And I think this is what we can learn from the United Kingdom. We have much more people who have their own companies who are entrepreneurs. Tourism, which you saw in the second picture, is very important, as you see. If you look at the size, it's, uh, I think we are one of the 
tourist nations, number one, one of the top tourist nations, if you count it per capita. We have 560,000 beds for our tourists and 25 million arrivals with 8, 8 million people. And in the United Kingdom, we have 1.4 million and 61 million. So we have much more per capita who come to our country. So tourism is really very, very important. That's true. But it's only one part of the whole picture. We live quite the same, 80.7 years, hopefully, all of us. So there's no difference there. Where there's another big difference, and you will see that in, uh, in the presentation, is for Austria, the exports is very important. So about 60% of our GDP, of our wealth, comes from sending our goods and services abroad. For the United Kingdom, it's much less, because we are a bigger country, of course. Yeah, I think these things are uh, uh, just, you see a big difference is also the last line, is a big difference is that in Austria, you have a much bigger manufacturing base. You still have about 22%, 25% of the GDP which comes from manufacturing. And in the United Kingdom, the service sector is much more important, as you know, with the banking and uh, logistics and so on, the 77% service sector, 50% manufacturing. So I think this is also a very big difference, which we also see later on in the statistics, and which makes the economy stand on different feet. This is not so important, but I think what is important for our economies, the United Kingdom and Austria, is that I think we are based on innovation. And there I, you can also see that Austria and the United Kingdom are quite near to each other. We are so-called innovation followers. After the Switzerland and the Nordic lenders, it's United Kingdom and Austria, the group. I think we are both countries are very good in innovation, but we could all be a little bit better. But it's the important basis of our economy. What I just talked on the table a little bit, what many of those who know Austria and history will know, but which is totally unknown in, in the United Kingdom is Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe, the Balkans. This was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and then there was the Iron Curtain, and it was totally separated, and since 20 years, this has grown together again, and not politically. There are no tendencies in Austria to come back to a monarchy, to come back to a big state covering these, but economically and culturally it's growing together. So Austria, <coughs> as a very small country, is still the investor number one in in, um, in Serbia and in Turkey even, in Bosnia, in Slovenia, in Croatia. So these are all these countries which don't play an important role for the United Kingdom <coughs> because you have the Commonwealth and other countries. But for Austria, this area is extremely important and mainly the Austrian companies will be doing business in those former countries of the monarchy. So I think this is also something where we are quite in different parts in Europe with each other. So you know all these reasons and um, I think it's just also important to, have to know that, for example, in Vienna we have approximately 1,000 international companies who have their headquarters for Eastern Europe there. So if London or the United Kingdom is a hub for many companies for Europe in general, Vienna would be the hub for Eastern Europe, for the Balkans, and often also the Middle East. That's also something which is perhaps not so well known. That's why Vienna has also become a very international city. You have the United Nations, you have the international companies, and so on. Um, how does it look between our two countries in trade? I think if we look at it historically, because I just found out that your Rotary <coughs> Club was founded in 1946, our trade commission here was founded in 1947, so we can look back to a similar period of history. And if you look at the numbers again, it's just important to see how it has changed. And strikingly, it's become quite good from the 70s onwards, but you see the big jump is actually starts after the after Austria became a member of the EU. From 95, 2000 onwards, the numbers really increase. What we do see also is that Austria exports nearly twice as much as it imports from the United Kingdom. And this has to do partly that in the United Kingdom, less is produced, as we saw in the other statistic, and Austria still has a very strong manufacturing basis. And so, we have a very, very high trade, uh, active, um, active trade balance with the United Kingdom. So I think this is also something which could change. I've just seen in the last few months, it's changing a little bit because the Austins are very keen to buy the new models of Range Rovers and so on. And really, you can see a jump in the statistic. So with some more of these products rolling out of the factory shops here, I think this might change. But this is important. We will see a little bit. I will ask you also what kind of products, apart from Range Rover, it may be that we are trading. Any 
ideas? Chocolate. <laughs> Chocolate. That's our favorite export product. It's Mozart, Google as we call them, but it doesn't really amount to 3.6 billion euros. So, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, so those lovely things which we also export is wine, for example. And we love, I love, we have some wine fairs and we love to eat that. But in the sum, we export 3.6 billion euros and the wine would be 1.5 million. <coughs> it doesn't really add up. So the main things is our exchange is actually machinery and equipment in both directions. It's about 40 to 45 percent of our foreign trade. We export many parts for cars, we export lorries, we export even finished cars to the United Kingdom and we buy, of course, the lovely Jaguars and Range Rovers and Minis from the UK. We buy JCB machinery and equipment and so on. So we actually, it's very interesting to see in the statistics that we buy and sell nearly the same products but of course of different quality, of different make. But that's the main exchange. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, we export also a lot of finished products like CD-ROMs, CD, DVDs, mm -hmm. which come from Austria, from Salzburg, and manufactured by Sony, but in Austria. Mm -hmm. And uh, we buy a lot of pharmaceuticals, where I think the United Kingdom is one of the strongest nations in the world with medicines and pharmaceuticals. So that's perhaps the difference. Otherwise, there's a change of similar goods. I think what is also there when we talk about goods is one thing, and then we have the services, where the United Kingdom is also strong, and the exchange of services is also very important. So we sell about 1.6 billion on services to the United Kingdom, and we buy 1.5 billion. What would the main service be, if you think in economic terms and statistical terms? You all know it, but it's often... Tourism? Exactly, yeah. So I think the main tourist sector where we uh, where we get about half a billion euros every year from the United Kingdom is, is you gentlemen coming to Austria skiing and visiting Vienna. So thank you for that. <laughs> but we buy for about half a billion euros every year patents and licenses from UK. And I think this is, uh, just shows how strong the United Kingdom is, is in intellectual property. This is for pharmaceuticals, but it is the same for BBC stories on, the, uh, on television which are bought in Austria and the license paid to London. So tourists and licenses about the same amount, half a billion each. It just shows this is where we really differ very much. So who knows Austrian companies? Rolex. Sorry? Rolex. 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 No, unfortunately not. You see, we love when people say that, but unfortunately it's across the border, yes. <laughs> it's our Swiss friends who are magical, they have all the names. For example, you also don't know the Milka Sucker Chocolate? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's Swiss, but it's manufactured in Austria at least. But the Rolex is not, unfortunately. But if you see, I've got some names here. Perhaps you will know one or the other. Lieber, you know? Okay, that shows your in the business, Swarovski, exactly. So very often people say Swarovski, I know very well, but it's not Austrian, is it? But it is. Yeah. That's the surprise. There's another big, which is not here, big company, which all of you know. But I'm sure Nestle. nobody knows that it's Austrian. Because it has an English name. Nestle. Uh, not, not that would be nice to have, yeah. No, it's, it's Red Bull. Red Bull. Red Bull has a pure manufacturing in Austria, and we gave it a very nice German name, Red Bull, so that everybody would know it comes from Austria. So that's another surprise. It just shows these are the products which either you know the name, but you don't know it's from Austria, or you know the product, and you've used it, uh, and you don't know it's from Austria. Or what happens very often with all these products, I think you've come in touch with most of them. If you're building a home, you've surely used tiles from Wienerberger here. Or if you go to a casino, you've used machinery from Novomatic, which they make uh, casino equipment. Or if you've ever, I've never done it, but <coughs> if you're flying British Airways first class, you've had food from Do and Co. and so on. So it's many of these companies who have products which they sell abroad, they're not known by their name. And normally, you don't have to know them. You don't, know, have, you don't have to know Leap Hair, as long as you know that crane is stable mm -hmm. and does what it should do. And, and that's, that's what the it's essence of that. Austrian companies is. And you'll see a few more uh, examples, and that's what I want to talk about, is actually, that it's, it's a high quality normally, should be, we hope so, but no brand names. And this is also something we can learn from the United Kingdom, 
where you're very good in marketing and having uh, also selling a product and making it to a name and to something known. This is what Austria is not very strong at. But Austrians are quite good, I think, in manufacturing things. And we'll see a few examples. And this is, by the way, also English companies in Austria, which you should know. So you see, again, it's very much in logistics, shopping, shopping malls. That's also where UK is very strong. And we have them everywhere in, in Austria. Um, so just to finish with the numbers, if you take everything together, the investment, the export, imports, we do have a trade relation, you could say, of 16.6 .6 billion euros. And I'm using the euros on purpose, just to show you that it still exists. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as I always say, it will exist for a long time, I'm absolutely sure. Um, so don't invite me if it doesn't exist. <laughs> but it's also easy to calculate, so it's about, and you've all been to everywhere, so you know it, it's 20% less is, is, is uh, pounds. So, but it's quite a lot. 14 to 15 billion pounds is quite a turnover, and I think there's also a surprise that our small countries, our small country, your big country, have uh, trade relations are quite important. But as I said, they're hidden. So I'm coming back again to some more names. And uh, here you see Red Bull. For example, um, but I have a picture of that. Um, for example, if you've ever been to the flagship store of Nike, in on uh, Oxo Circus. <coughs> if you go inside, it's a shop, but the whole shop fitting has been done by an Austrian company, Undash. And they did most of the big shops and flagship stops on Regent Street, for example. Again, a product you would never see and you don't have to see it, it just has to work. And it has to work for the partner, for Nike. They have to be uh, sure that uh, Undash, as the company is called, will deliver. But for a consumer, it's not important. Or if you go to Aston Martin, a wonderful car, then you don't have to know that the showroom, which hopefully looks nice, was built by Austrian company. The same here, if you know the Gherkin, I'm sure, this is the landmark of London, and you don't have to know that it was built, the engineering part on top, the typical part, was built by the Austrian company, Wagner Bureau, with Austrian steel and, and glass. The same where Boris Johnson talks and lives, is also an interior technical side, built again from Austin companies, which the name Wagner Bureau will not say anything to most of you, but it's, this is the essence, as I said, of the Austin uh, business. So one project which I like very much is the British Museum. It's always lovely to be there. And if you go into the Queen Elizabeth Court, Great Court uh, room, courtyard, that also, that roof was also done by Wagner Bureau. And they had to really, each glass pane has a different size. So it was quite an engineering feat to do what Lord Foster wanted them to do. That's, I mean, architects always have ideas, and then they need somebody who really delivers. Same with Ascot Race Course. Austin companies involved in the engineering works. The same is, for example, the Sander, Sunderland Aquatic Center, which was also this timber construction delivered by an Austin company, VHAC, and so on. So we have quite a few. And if you look at the Olympics, I mean, I can only congratulate you for the wonderful Olympics. They were perfectly organized, and I was here all the time. It, it was really lovely to be in London and to see the joy. But also to all the medals which you made, which is amazing. I must say we were very polite <laughs> people. We left the medals to all the other people. We didn't take one single medal away. So we did a little bit better with the Paralympics. But what we did do is about the Austin Combs had about 20 gold medals. So if you have the cable car across the Thames, this is a purely Austin product of Doppelmayr. Or if you have the big bridge going into the stadium and the lighting could also come from Austin again. You don't need to know the company as long as the cable car doesn't fall down. <laughs> Worldwide, the highest timber building ever built stands in East London, which has nine floors of purely timber. From outside, you don't see it anymore on the left, but it is pure timber, nothing else. And that was built in London by a studio company. But actually, that's very nice, and it's a good engineering feat, but the sad side, or the, the funny side is, they were not allowed to build it in Austria, because the building regulations don't allow timber buildings above three floors. <laughs> so they had to come to London, and this also shows the mind that the Austrians have a relation, and so this is what you can do. And the British say, if you tell us that you can achieve this and that, you can do whatever you like. And I think this is important to see a very different mindset 
in going and, and working with problems and with companies. And that's why it is here. Now in Austria, I think you're allowed to go up to five stores. Or stores Whereabouts in London is it's London? It's in East London. In East London, yeah. I can give you the address. I don't know it by heart, but I've seen it down And the same, of course, what's coming up is many timber buildings and these famous passive houses where you don't really need any more uh, much heating and so on. So that's also an area where Austria is quite strong. Wine we've talked about. I mean, but with food, and so we don't sell much in the United Kingdom. Many people go to Austria and seem to like the food, but selling it here is difficult. But we do have some who sell private label. For example, this, this goodness shakes. I yeah, wouldn't know it's pure English product, but inside is an Austrian milk shake. <laughs> yeah. or, for example, one of the big Austrian um, companies, Nürn, they built a plant in Shropshire, and now they are making the best English yogurt from English milk, but it's an Austrian investment. So you never know what is it Austrian, is it English? In the end, it's English cows and English milk, so it's an English product, but <laughs> you know how it comes from Austria. It's a good mix, I would say. And then you have the Swarovskis, and Freyville is another company. They make um, jewelry, or being able with furniture, many like the London Stock Exchange and so on. Again, products you wouldn't know. You don't have to know that the chair comes from them, but it is what it is. The cars, just to come back, as I said, even the black cap has some parts from Austria in it, the aluminium parts. They come from there. Austria is very, very strong in parts for the automotive industry. We export as many parts as we import finished cars. And also with the United Kingdom, as I showed you, we export more to the United Kingdom than we buy. Because, for example, the engines for Vauxhall, which is a General Motors car, they come from Vienna. They have a huge engine plant there. And the same is from Styria, for example. Some of the Aston Martin models, the Rapid and the Mini Countryman, they are manufactured in Austria, actually, by nowadays. And they come back to UK. Not all the models, only these special models. It's the Canadian Austrian company Magna, perhaps you've heard. One of, it's, one of, it's the biggest worldwide to manufacture cars and car parts, and they have a big plant in Austria. <coughs> and we have a very old tradition in building cars, so even if everybody thinks Porsche is, Austria, is German, it is actually Austrian, but nobody knows from behind this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so I think there are many areas where, where there are many possibilities and things we can do, and where Austrian companies are trying to be active on the market, where we do a lot is environment, waste management, this huge machinery and equipment to get rid of waste and make energy out of it, ICT, aerospace, and so on. So it's always the same story. It's a specific engineering area where there is know-how. And uh, I must admit, mainly also where you don't need too much marketing, but you have to be very precise. You have to do a good product. And where we, as I said, could learn is from marketing. And this, I, I hope, we will do. We are part of the embassy, but we have our own office. We have a trade commission. And uh, we have worldwide about 100 offices uh, where we support Austrian companies. As I said, founded in 1946. And the thing which is very different, you have the same here like UKTI, but the only difference is that in Austria it is funded purely by the companies directly. So we're not financed by the taxpayer. What we do is everything comes from the companies because we have a compulsory membership in the Austrian Federal Economic Chamber. So the chamber has the money and finances the foreign trade promotion organizations. That's very unique. That also means that whatever we do, we have to see that we do it for our companies directly because they pay us. And that, I think, gives you always some pressure to, to really try to help them. And we have uh, less reports to write for, for the ministry, but to help the companies. And lots of events and whatever they need, we try to do. Um, having said that, before I just finish and leave you, if I manage, I'll leave you with a very short film which tries to show this picture again. <coughs> Worked in the office, so... <laughs> <laughs> Always does, isn't it? Always. I tried once again.
Oh, oh down. <laughs> well, good. Well, thank you very, very much. Good. Thank, very good. Good. thank you very much, John. Uh, so, there's any questions? Mm. Sure. Jeff, you're first. Um, it's not so much um, economics, it's more political, I guess. This, you have such a low level of unemployment, but do you have a high uh, incidence of immigration that adds to that unemployment, or what's the situation? We have a very high incidence of immigration, and we have about 10 to 12 percent of, um, of the population is foreigners in Austria. It's quite high, mostly from the Balkans and from Turkey. And um, we still, and I, I must say, I think Austria is not very good in integrating these people. So the strange situation is that on the one hand, we have a very low rate of unemployment. On the other hand, the businesses, or okay, actually works together, but the businesses are looking for, of uh, skilled labor everywhere. They are even looking to Spain today. And there I think the problem is that many of the immigrants, they were not really integrated and many, we lose them on the way. They could be very good skilled workers, but they get lost in, in, in translation, in the, in the real sense of the word, because they grow up without learning German proper and without learning their own language. You know all these problems. But there also was not very, very good. But still it was possible to get the unemployment rate that low because we have this vocational training and we try to get the youth into the factories and into the working places very early. So we have a much lower level of university level for degrees. And that's something which strikes me always, because in Austria we always say we should have more people going to university. <laughs> and um, that's what we learn, and that's what the worldwide everybody say. And as a matter of fact, it, for the economy, it works better to have people educated in vocational skills, people from from professional background, from schools, and then of course also the university level education. And having said that, until a few years ago, we didn't have a bachelor degree. So the only thing you could do at university was a master. That's why, of course, we had less students and many more dropouts than you would have in England, where university level is a bachelor, and then you go for a master. It was the other way around in Austria. So all these things play a role, but that's why I, I would say there's a good mix today. People with the educational system. So you have a strong apprenticeship scheme. So. A very strong one, yes. Yeah. Uh, Dick, you have a question? Oh, <coughs> yes. Uh, there's been a lot of 
news, George, uh, recently about the uh, euro yes. and about uh, the way the common market is going to go. Yeah. Would it be in Austria's interest if, in fact, if, in a sense, a large amount of national significance of things like budgetary control uh, and other things were done as a whole rather than, in fact, still in largely with the individual countries? Would you gain or would you lose? I think Europe would win, absolutely. Because I, I can believe that if you look at the world today, we have big blocks and Europe is just losing if we look at each country separately. Europe can only win if we go together as Europe and be a major factor in the world politics. Do, do looking at Austria, yeah. I think it would also... Austria is a little bit like Germany, so we, we, don't, we have to do our homework, but we've done a lot in the last years. So we, our debt level is not as high as in Greece, luckily. But still, I think we could all win if we did it together. I firmly believe in this because it makes us strong and the pressure would be higher so that you don't have the local political pressure to spend more money, which you always have before elections come up. So I think it would be good to answer your question. But just to also to talk about one myth, which is there that Austria, Germany, and so and and some of the Nordic countries are the big winners in this game of the euro. It's not absolutely true. If you look at the numbers, then Austrian real income has not risen in the last 10, 15 years since we joined the euro. It has actually fallen in comparison to Greece or Italy, where real income has risen in 15 years. Just to set that record straight, that it always says the Germans and Austrians are, um, are the beneficiaries of the euro politics. It's not true statistically. I think what really happened is and you're doing it the same in the United Kingdom is in Germany, but also in Austria, the homework was done, and we had austerity, a little bit of austerity over 15 years. And now, of course, if you had told this to the Austrians 50 years ago, that you'll have 50 years of austerity, you can imagine what would have happened. <laughs> Luckily, nobody told them. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 really, we can laugh, but actually, it's, it's true. And that's the problem. Today, you have to tell the Greek, you have 15 years of austerity in front of you. And that doesn't work. And it wouldn't have worked in Austria, it wouldn't have worked in Germany. And the Germans also went 15 years of austerity after the unification. So just to put that straight, but I'm still convinced that also for Austria, it would be good to have a more centralized fiscal policy to get Europe together. We would only lose if the euro fell apart again. And should, should the United Kingdom be part of that euro? euro? Absolutely. Mm. But that's my personal feeling, which I always say what I think, but I know it's, it, the reality is not the same, but I absolutely think that Europe is Europe and can only be strong together. That's, we have other, others outside of Europe who, who are there who are much more challenging for us. Any other questions, fellows? <coughs> In that case, can I ask uh, Ron to uh, give a vote of thanks, please? Thank you, Mr. President. Well, George, uh, that was really a most interesting, very, yeah, very yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think everybody, as you probably noticed, paid rapt attention. So all I can say is, feel and dunk. That's what I was there. <laughs> and I hope the question mark is gone now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, George.